All right, my name is Aaron Batchelor. I am a, uh, let's say, seasoned? <laughs> um, up and comer. I'm an up and comer. Um, I am a professional. I, um, I've been shooting photos for a long time, but what I learned since the beginning of 2011 is there is a giant difference between taking a snapshot and taking a photo. And that's what I think I'm going to try and help you get that transition today. There's a lot of people, they walk up, they go click, and then they move on. And I think this class will help you perhaps move beyond that stage and see things in a slight Um, Who knows who this is? Oh, no. That's actually me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, this is the Superstition Mountains. I actually took this January of last year. Um, but the beauty of this photo is the parking lot is like over here. So I literally walked 400 feet and took this. And I thought that I, I loved when I took it and then I loved when I put it in black and white. So that's one of the things that you're going to learn is you can't always see everything from the road. But it's a will get you where you want to go. Okay, so let's talk about what this class is and isn't. But it isn't. I don't believe that everybody to take a great photo has to immediately run out and go buy a DSLR. I'm not a big believer in that. I think, you know, that you can use a standard point and shoot camera. Some of the some of the better photos I've taken I've taken on a standard point shoot. This is not the end all be all of everything photography. You're not going to walk out and become the next Ansel Adams, but you'll be on your way to being a better photographer. It's a lot to learn, but I think, you know, put the, the investment into it and the time, you can do it. This is not for the serious amateur or the professional. If you're walking around with carbon fiber tripod and the brand new Mark D, you know, 2 or what are they on to now? Okay, whatever he says. Um, <laughs> You're probably not, you know, you're not going to find a whole lot here. But for somebody that's got a point shoot, that's got a camera phone, this is definitely a good spot. What it is, it's a discussion about how to improve your shots with a minimal amount of money. Notice I didn't say free. There are some investments that are made in photography, um, but they're always to your benefit. This is designed for beginning photographers and it is an open discussion. I welcome your questions. So if you have any, raise your hand. I'll be happy to answer them. If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer, but uh, chances are I probably will. Okay, so step one. I know it sounds very, very simple, but read, read, and then read some more. Real simple, you've got to learn the basics. Learn what the different things that your camera can do, and that starts off with your camera manual. A lot of people, me included, get a camera, Christmas Day or whatever. You open it up, oh God, I love this camera, click, 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 click. I owned a camera for five years and never read the manual. So I had no idea what the camera was actually capable of. That's why you read the manual, because as you're learning these basics, as you're learning what, the, uh, what an f-stop is, and, and you're learning how to take pictures of race cars, those kind of things, your camera is only as smart as the owner, and you have to sometimes take control of it. That's where the manual comes into play, because you're then learning how to take control of the situation. It's Fifty Shades of Photography. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am a big believer in, in the world of blogs. There are some really great ones out there. Um, one of my personal favorites, if you Google Digital Photography School, DPS, um, they have some of the best photographers in the world are on there. They offer their information for free, but they also offer uh, e-books, which are super cheap. I mean, you can buy, if a brand new one comes out, you can buy them for 15 bucks. And they're very well written. They have lots of great examples in it. And I've been very, very pleased with Digital Photography School. There's also a new emerging world out there of um, digital magazines that are coming out. Uh, for the iPad owners, there's actually a weekly magazine that has just launched, and they're offering five free issues right now. 
want to learn more about it, see me after class and I'll show you exactly what it is. It is fabulous. I really, really, really enjoy it. Okay. So now that you've read your manual and you've figured out all this stuff, I want you to look at the auto part of your camera and I want you to say, we've had some special times. We really did. But those times are now done. If your camera has a mode dial on it or some sort of mode feature, I highly encourage you to start using it today. The reason why, as I mentioned before, is A, you're smarter than your camera. B, auto eliminates a lot of the creativity that you have. If I was to go down to the Mill Avenue Bridge tonight, pull out my camera at dusk, if I have it on auto, what happens? Flash pops up, I shoot, flash comes out, I go home, I'm really excited because boy that, that bridge looked beautiful and there's lights and it's reflecting off the water and what is it that I see? A dark photo. Because to the camera, it sees, oh, it's dark in front of me. I need to compensate with flash. That's where this mode dial comes in. PASM. You might see it a little bit different on a camera. Uh, I'm sorry, on a Canon. And what that basically stands for is program mode, aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual. Program mode is your next step from auto. What that does is if you want to change the aperture, and I'll explain that in just a second, the camera will then automatically make an adjustment for you on shutter and ISO. ISO is the speed. Remember, in the old days, you used to go out and buy 400 speed film because you were planning on taking faster action, or you'd buy the 100 speed film because you wanted to take a picture of your kids at an Easter party outside. So, Program mode takes care of a lot of that for you. It's a, it's a step up from auto. It's not the perfect solution, but it is helping you get away from, from auto. At least gives you some control. Aperture priority. Aperture priority controls the opening of the lens. The opening of the lens determines a lot of things. What's in focus? The more that lens is open, the shorter your focal range is. So that works in beautiful for those shots where you're taking a photo of a, a child and they've got a bunch of stuff behind them, but you kind of want to blur it out. That's where aperture priority mode comes in. You don't normally use this on something like um, kids running on a track. You would use it for portrait shots. And it gives you a nice background effect, especially if you want to blur it out. I'll show you some of the photos that I've taken where aperture priority has come into play. Shutter priority is entirely based around you wanting to take faster action. You now control the speed of the shutter. As slow as you want, you can make it as fast as you want. Some people would say, well, why would I want to slow the shutter down? You know those shots where there's a waterfall, the water looks kind of milky and doesn't look like, you know, just water droplets, it's all one continuous stream of water. That's where shutter priority comes in because you've slowed the shutter speed down. Manual is for those that are truly ballsy and want to have full control over everything. You control the ISO, you control the aperture, you control the shutter. It's great to go this direction. Highly encourage it. A, it slows you down on your shots. It's very, I wouldn't take, if you've got a toddler at home, don't even think about manual for a while. Because <laughs> by the time you click in, figure out you know whether you're overcompensating or undercompensating exposure, the toddler's already moved on someplace else. Yes, sir. Uh, big Show. Okay. Not to be confused with the wrestler, which I get a lot of tweets about. You know. Oh man, you suck! I, don't, I can't believe you hit John Cena in the face. What me? Um, some shots aren't possible with auto. So, like I mentioned, that shot of taking a nighttime shot of a bridge. That's not possible with auto. Sure, you'll, you'll get something. Uh, you'll probably get the wall in front of you, and maybe if there's a duck and he's near the wall, you'll get that too. But what you're actually trying to shoot, 
no go. Speaking of, this is one of the Mill Avenue photos that I took. This is around mm, 5.30 or 6 in December of last year. Just got my camera, so I was, I was uh, fresh off reading the manual. So, so third, third suggestion for you is better photography does cost some money. Uh, as I mentioned previously, it is not free. There are some things that you can do um, that will help you. For the people that shoot camera phones, this may not be as much of a, of a help, but there are mounts that will work for you for a tripod. They're a little on the pricey side and finding it a little ridiculous, charging $40 or $50 for what is essentially a little hooked piece of metal. Uh, I think I've seen Gorilla Pod does have a few out there now. Yeah, it's too. not Gorilla Pod, but it's, uh, there's actually one, I think it was Kickstarted or something. Nice. A lot of other people trying to solve problems. <laughs> um, so one of the first things I would suggest, especially if you have a point and shoot, is get a tripod. Sorry, I remember the, the name of it. It's called the Serif. Okay. S-E-R-I-F? Yep. Because it looks like a Serif. Okay. So not that little no, that no, really thing. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So a tripod will help you on lots of different things. Um, the number one thing that will help you on is anything that you need a long exposure for. If you need to leave the shutter open for any length of time beyond one twentieth of a second, you're going to need a tripod for that. That's for night shots, uh, want to shoot the moon, those kind of things. Reason you need a tripod is if you move that camera at all, shot up. It's just a blurry mess. And it's great if you want to sell it off as artistic, but it doesn't come off pretty good. A lot of people don't know about reflectors. Um, these are great for also great for moving light around. If you're in an area that's a little darker, these come in handy. They pop off just like this. And they do lots of different things. This little silver side, you can if you've got a small amount of light that's coming in, you can bounce it literally onto somebody's face so you get a little better exposure. If you want to block the light out entirely, you have a black side. You take it out all together. And then as you zip these off. You then go to this white part. This is what's called the diffuser. So light's coming in, shooting down on somebody's face. You've seen the shot probably a billion times where it's a really nice shot of somebody, but half their face is dark. This would solve that. Granted, it's a little cumbersome. Uh, probably don't want to do it one-handed. If you've got somebody else with you, ask them, hey, can you hold this up for me for a second? Blocks the light out. Does a great job. Huh? <laughs> I've, I've literally done that. I've literally had people do that. And they're not very expensive. You can find them on Amazon for as cheap as you know, 10, 15 bucks. So they're they're a good solution. If you have a DSLR um, and the, the lenses that you're using are just the ones that came with the camera, consider upgrading your lens. There are very, very expensive options out there. You can buy literally a $16,000 lens. And that is a giant lens that you need a Sherpa to help you move around. <laughs> or, you know, some sort of pack mule. There's also, you know, there's also considerably cheaper lenses out there. Um, I know for Canon, you guys have got the 50 millimeter, what's that run? 100 bucks. 100 bucks. Um, for Nikon, their 50 millimeter 1.8 is about 200. They do a fantastic job uh, with portraits, wanting to shoot photos of your kids, um, night shots. They respond better. A, they're they're better for lower light, and B, they're better quality lights. Just a thought. Obviously, if you have a point and shoot or camera phone. You're not going to be able to do that. You know, you can call up Nikon and say, "I'd like to buy a sixteen thousand dollar lens for my point and shoot." So after they get done giggling, they'll tell you that you know 
Sorry. They, they do make, like, you know, for the iPhone and other cameras, attachable, like, you know, wide angle. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, they it's do, not, yeah. not going to change stuff like this, you know, it's not going to improve low light for And if you have a crappy camera phone, like this thing is yeah. terrible. This is the uh, fourth generation iPod Touch. It is a terrible one. Yes. I, I've been unhappy with every yeah. single photo it's ever taken. There's probably more of the sensor than anything. Yeah. You can also go the route of used equipment and even renting cameras. If you want to learn how to use the DSLR but you don't want to go out and spend, you know, eight hundred dollars today, you can rent a camera. And they're not that expensive to do that. Borrowlenses.com is a good site for that. Um, they'll ship it right to your home. You have you, know, you rent it for however long you want to use it, send it back. It's all it's, it's good to go. For local uh Tempe camera. Tempe, Tempe Camera, and I was just going to get on to the local camera shop. Um, Tempe Camera, I've actually had an experience with them, and, and I'll, I'll tell you about this in just a second. A lot of people like Amazon because you can find stuff a little bit cheaper than your local camera shop, but the reason that you might want to consider your local camera shop is A, the guys that are running it are real hardcore camera nerds. I mean, they, they know their stuff. If you call them up and say what you're trying to shoot, they can definitely steer you in the direction you want to go. The other thing is, because local is in some ways kind of a dying breed, customer service trumps all. If I have a problem and I call Amazon, I'm getting some dude in a call center somewhere who isn't really all that interested in my complaint, is more interested in trading out the lens. You know, if I call up Tempe Camera, I've got a guy that's real interested in what I have to say and real interested in fixing my problem. One example is about, uh, let's see, winter of 2011, giant typhoon hit Thailand, wiped out Nikon's plant. So lenses, some of their camera bodies were having to be produced in different locations. That meant that they had to retool locations. That meant that the, it took a lot longer to get a lens out there. And the lens that I was looking for was that 50 millimeter 1.8 lens. Really, really excited about it. Well, couldn't find it anywhere. Went on Amazon, looked all over the place, could not find it for the life of me. I call up Tempe Camera because their website lists, we got three in stock. Call up Dr. This guy and he says, oh, I'm sorry, no, no we're. We're, we're not correct on that, unfortunately, your inventory is wrong. Says, but, let me take your name and number, and when you get one in, I'll give you a call. That conversation took place in the middle of January. Valentine's Day, I get a call from Jim at Tempe Camera saying, Hey, how you doing? I said, Good, who's this? This is Jim from Tempe Camera. I said, Jim, you have some good news for me? I <laughs> He took the time to remember me six weeks later and gave me a call and let me know that he had it in. Amazon didn't do that. I mean, I, and, and I did put myself on an email list when Amazon got it in. Uh, I got that email in the middle of April. So I give credit to Tempe Camera for putting the work out there and for having people that were really interested in making sure that I got what I needed. Yeah, before you He bought a lot of equipment on eBay and you know, bought you know, some really, really nice lenses out of the box once and has never touched it again. Yeah, and even if they've had it for a year or two, um, people that own a DSLR are, tend to treat their cameras pretty good. I mean, they don't, people that I know don't, you know, just Pulling it over their head, and you know they, they don't treat it like a cheap camera because it's not. It's an expensive piece of machinery. Bumping it against something usually doesn't resolve the thing, so they, they try their best to take care of it. They you know they buy camera backpacks, and they, you know they they take the investment of the time to make sure that their equipment's good. So you're right, you can get some really great stuff. 
And you can be looking at a $500 lens on Amazon and find that exact same lens that a guy's been using for about a year, wants to upgrade his equipment, now he's selling it for 285 on eBay. That's a smoking deal. So my fourth step, pretty common sense. Practice makes perfect. Shooting more. More, more, more. This beautiful woman, my mom, my mom, love you. Um, and my mom has been so generous as to volunteer her time to, to be my model. Um, most of the shooting I've done is landscape photography. I can stand there for an hour and take a photo of a tree, and it'll never get tired of me. It'll never say, oh, my God, did I just get a red bull on a chair, please? <laughs> um, so my mom has been very, very kind in, in taking out some of her time to allow me to just do what I need to do and, and learn the craft and learn how to take better photos of people. Because I, I'm pretty good at taking the, you know, photos of cactus, but people I got a lot to learn on. So start with things that you know. Take pictures of your pets, your kids. Uh, if you got a neighbor that's got a vintage car, ask them if he's willing to do that. Um, there's car shows all over the place. Um, some of them you wouldn't even expect. You can go to a Kmart parking lot on a Friday and there's vintage cars everywhere. You can also, and, and this one I know from personal experience, go to Comic Con. Those nerds love to be, have photos taken. Love it. The ones that are dressed up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the security guy is probably not. Like you don't go to the ferry or, you know. Elf or anything? I'm usually carrying around. Kind of fit in. Kind of hardcore, right? Um, you can do Huh? Photography. Yeah. One of the things that can help you encourage taking more photos is a thing called Project 365. Um, you may have heard of it. It's the concept of taking a photo every single day for a year. It doesn't have to be the most stunning photo that you've ever taken. You'll notice that the first shots that you take, kind of plain Jane, don't have a whole lot to them. But as you start to learn your camera, as you start to learn the basics, and as you start shooting more, those photos of the sunset will go from, yeah, to, oh my God. I personally have experienced that. Going back through my photos through Project 365, I've noticed that my photos have gotten a little bit better over time. Uh, not as glass quality, but better. And it encourages me to try new things uh, and to experience new things. Don't settle for the walk-up shot. What's the walk-up shot? That mountain is gorgeous. Click. Let's go. Sometimes the best shot that you can find is not the one that immediately appears before you. Sometimes it's the one behind you. I have made that mistake more times than I can count. Uh, going on a hike, taking these really great shots in front of me, moving on. Now I'm coming back. And now I'm noticing all the stuff I didn't see and I'm really tired. And I've been shooting for three and a half hours. People I'm with are like, dude, let's just get to the point. Now I'm missing that shot because I'm too tired for it, I'm not focused, and I missed it the first place. I'm going to find another trip, do it all over again, and make sure I do it right the next time. Before you click, check the, comp the composition. This photo of my mom, you do not notice that there is a gentleman sitting right back here doing a uh, beatbox. The reason you don't notice him is because I had to Photoshop him out. That took me about 40 minutes to do that. over and over and over that photo. I could get him out a little bit, and this wall wouldn't come out right. And Yes, Photoshop will do some miraculous things for you, but if you get it right in the camera, you don't have to worry about that. So before you take a shot, look here, 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 and here. What's in the photo? Is it compelling? Do you like how it looks? Is there a weird dude in the back wearing a neon green jacket doing a <laughs> you know, because he will be there when you take that photo if you don't look. Go 
somewhere, do something. This is where uh, Project 365 comes into play because it encourages you to take a new photo every single day. And there's only so many photos of Roscoe the cat that we can take. <laughs> Roscoe's a great cat, love him, but I've done seven shots of his belly in the sun and it's time to move on to something else. So start with exploring the city that you live in. Go out, find places that you haven't been before or places that you've driven past a billion times. If you live in Mesa, go to the Mesa Art Center. The place is built for photography. Gorgeous. If you live in a really boring city, take an trip. Go someplace else. Go to Sedona. Go to Crescent. Go to Tucson. There's lots of great shots all over the state. I learned through photography that Arizona uh, may suck in its politics and it's really hot in the summer, but it is a fabulous state. It is so much here. You hear those old people, oh, it's so beautiful in Arizona. You've been here all your life, you get kind of tired of it, but the, the way you don't get tired of it is you get in your car and you drive places you haven't been before. Buy a travel book. If you're going someplace outside that you haven't been before, or even local places, buy a book that's going to tell you what is actually there, so that you know where you're going, what you're actually shooting. Nothing worse than showing up to Los Angeles and having no idea what you're going to photograph. Flickr. That is my number one source of inspiration. I don't call it stealing because I'm not stealing somebody else's photo. What I am doing is I'm getting a scout location for free. When I, when I wanted to shoot that photo of the Mill Avenue Bridge, I typed in Mill Avenue Bridge and I looked at all the photos that everybody had and I had an idea of where they shot those photos. I could see it in my mind. And then I started to see some photos from certain people that looked really great in specific vantage point. And I thought, okay, I like their daytime shot. I'm going to go do a nighttime shot. I'm going to learn how to shoot this at night. And I went there in a pretty similar location. So it's a slightly different photo. Not trying to steal anybody's work, but I do at least have that inspiration from Flickr. And I've used it every single place I've gone just as an idea of what it is that I'm actually walking into. And there's some obscure stuff. You don't have to just put in Payson. You can put in the trail that you're going to go on or the place you're going to go. If you want to put in Watson Lake, type in Watson Lake and you'll get lots and lots of shots. If you decide to go hiking, which I highly encourage, please don't go alone. You tell at least two people and give them a time frame of when to expect a phone call from you and then make that phone call. I know that sounds like common sense, and it is, but how many times do you see in the news Jim Koblowski, really great guy, now dead because he went out in the desert, got lost, nobody knew where he was, nobody knew when he was coming home, they found him two weeks later, you know, that there's, there's lessons to be learned by those stories. Hiking is wonderful. This shot is taken as the result of the hike from the uh, Oak Fork Trail, or the uh, yeah, Oak Fork Trail in, in um, West Fork Trail in Oak Creek Canyon. So hiking takes you to places that you just cannot see from the road, but you need to do it safely. Bring enough water, bring a friend. Friends are great. Photography is all about light, getting more of it, getting less of it. So when you're working with daytime hours, especially you need to learn how to work with the sun, first thing you learn is what is the magic hour. The magic hour, I've heard different variations of it. I've heard the first and the last hour of the day. I've heard it called the last hour of the day. For my purposes, I tend to call it the last hour of the day because I don't want to get up at 6 a.m. I'm just too damn lazy. <laughs> but the lighting is significantly different. You know what I'm talking about. When you do 2 in the afternoon, it is blue skies, clouds. But at 6 o'clock, these clouds now become nice and gold and beautiful and a wonderful to shoot. This shot taken from my patio. 
didn't have to go anywhere. She, I just set up my tripod and I waited for stuff to happen. Worst time of day to shoot? In most situations, middle of the day. Ten, four, depending on the time of year. The lighting doesn't work very well for you. If you're taking a photo of somebody, oh, thank you. You end up um, getting shots with sun across the face, and you really don't get good, solid lighting. But there's ways to counteract that. One of them is put people in the shade, find a tree, get them underneath that, especially if that tree has a lot of solid shade across. Calibrated trees are not good for that, <laughs> as I have learned. Because you'll find this really great shot of your mom with a streak here, a streak here, a streak here. It looks like Freddy Krueger got to her. Just black marks across her face. If you don't have shade, put the sun to your back. The reason for that being is if you are standing there taking a photo of somebody and they're doing this, that's not good. That's Nobody likes having a nice squinty photo. I have the words <laughs> Yes, yes, there, there you go. There you go. And a big hat. Yeah. Um, okay. Or you can use a diffuser. Diffusers help, uh, and you'll notice immediately that your your model will go from, ah, uh, to, ah. Uh, they'll be very, very happy with the result. No, like the diffuser usually. Yes. Like, why bring you take it out and Yep. That would put them in the shade, you would put that between them. It doesn't put them in the shade, but what it does is it takes a lot of the light out and it balances it out. Okay. So the light comes across and it actually, instead of being, you know, stripe across the face, it's now a solid, okay. solid shot. Great sunsets need clouds. If you find a cloudy day, pull out your camera. It's going to be a nice sunshine. It will take so many shots of a crappy sunset before you get a, a beautiful one, but this is the time of year when the really good ones come. Summertime, not as much. I've, I've seen a few, but you tend to run into the really best stuff here in the winter. Challenging yourself. In this case, your heights. This shot was taken on, on my parents' roof with a 300 millimeter lens at a distance trying not to fall off the roof <laughs> and I'm scared of heights too so not only am I climbing up the ladder I gotta figure out how to climb down it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it was not a fun down. <laughs> but I, I love this shot. It was, worth, it was worth all the work. One of the things that you can do to challenge yourself is shoot for a calendar. That's actually something I have done. I'm on to my second round of them. Uh, look at it. I know that it's an unconference, so I'm not to sell you anything. But if you want a copy, give me your email address. I will be happy to sell you one. But I'm not going to attempt it here. Here to look through there. I spent a year going all over the state, traveling about 1,000 miles to shoot for 12 months of the calendar. It's something that I, I dedicate myself to. I put a lot of pride into it. And when I put that online and I, and I have people that buy it, I feel a tremendous source of pride. I don't care if it's friends or family that are buying it or some random dude in the Indiana. I'm still thrilled with the fact that I did it, I made it a goal, and I accomplished it. And I busted my ass to make it happen. Yeah. Wait till they see the 2013 version. The 2012 is good. That is stunning. Thinking outside the box. Trying shots that you would normally try. Shooting things that are foreign to you. If you like taking photos of your kids all over the place, try taking photos of not only your kids, but Maybe the mountain that's behind them. Get into landscape photography if you're a portrait photographer, and vice versa. Try testing your skills. Sunset storms and fireworks are very complicated to shoot, but they do challenge you, and they do produce some great results.
One of the shots, uh, the July one in there, is a shot of the the Mill Avenue Bridge this last July 4th, when it was, what, 84 for the high? Uh, I've never seen that many people around the Mill Avenue Bridge in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful night. But to get that shot, I had to, had to invest in some equipment. I had to learn how to how to do it. And then I stood there, and instead of enjoying the you know the, the fireworks like everybody else, I'm standing there waiting for booms, and then waiting for pow. So I knew when to open the shutter and close it when the shutter release. Entering the photo contest. Chances are, and I, I'm sorry to say this, they're not going to win. I'm not going to win, but at least you try. At least you put your best work out there. Arizona Highways has an annual photo contest that is free. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that go on there and enter their photos. The reason that you do this is not to do the nanny nanny boo boo over other people, but you can go on there and you can see how your work compares to other people. And you can say, I've got some work to do. Or, man, I belong with some of these people. Up your skills. And it challenges you. Because the guy, you know, I thought, boy, I, my photos last year were pretty good. I put them on there. Of course, they didn't win. And I was looking at some of the other people's photos. And, you know, I was done the nanny and boo boo. And then I saw the guy that won. Blew my, blew my socks off. Absolutely fabulous shots. This is a controversial subject, but I am of the firm belief that editing is good, even if it's something as simple as turning this color photo into a black and white. I knew when I shot that, that was going to be a black and white shot. This was at a, um, a presentation at the Chandler Center of the Arts. It was called the Austin Hades Prom. These people were actors. So you're sitting around and watching all these people have a good time. Some of them are, are joined in, you know, the people that are there are joining in with the actors. But I knew when I saw this shot, when they put their hands up and that spotlight is coming down, I knew that was a black and white shot. Am I wrong for editing it? No. I don't think so. Color correction, cropping, and editing is not cheating. Cheating is when you completely change the photo. When you take a photo of you and your family and you throw Brad Pitt in there because you can Photoshop a bit, that's slightly cheating. Uh, if you add a, a mountain in that didn't exist, to me technically that's cheating. But if you are just making some basic edits to it, you're taking out uh, you know the guy in the background that's waving. Um, if you're trying to change some elements to it to make the, the photo a little bit more appealing, I don't think that that's wrong. Form of creativity and Absolutely. make it your vision. Absolutely. Um, you know, there, most of the photos that you see, especially of, uh, you know, people, they're all edited. Nobody looks that good. There's, there's some sort of manipulation that goes on in every single photo. Even if you're not doing it through Photoshop, if you're taking a photo of a baby, you're dressing it up, you're putting it in a you know, basket with certain colors around it, you're, you're manipulating the photo in some way. Get creative, but avoid the Instagram look. Oh, I love Instagram. I think it's a great way to get your photos out to lots and lots of people. I hate those fucking filters. <laughs> Um, I think they do. I think they do some some neat stuff. You can make your photos look like the 1970s, and that's great. But sometimes I see these really fantastic shots that people have taken, and then throw the 1970s filter on it, and I'm like, oh my god, dude, that photo of Sedona is fabulous, except for the fact you made it look like a you know a disco thing. Why did you do that? Why why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Oh, almost out of time. Photoshop versus Elements. Most people don't buy Photoshop because it's what five six hundred dollars. Uh, it's, it's a little on the price side, but you can do about ninety percent of what Photoshop will do via Photoshop Elements. It will allow you to do the color correction. It'll allow you to do the cropping. It'll allow you to do you know some basic editing and you know get those people out of your photos that that aren't supposed to be there.
Yeah, I think it does. I know, I know Nine does. It doesn't do a very good job of it, <laughs> but it does do it. Um, Elements works best if you have a spot in your photo that's not supposed to be there. Uh, it doesn't work so great if a building is there and you're trying to take that out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or a light flare or something of that nature. Lightroom is kind of a companion to Photoshop. Originally it was designed by Adobe to allow you to catalog your photos, but there is some basic editing functions to it and a lot of the photographers I know no longer buy Photoshop, they buy Lightroom. And Lightroom, this past year, they dropped the price down to 150 bucks. I've seen it as low as 90. So it's it's a good investment. It does a lot of the basic edits. Um, doesn't do everything, but it does. You know, it'll do a lot of the stuff that you want to do. It's really good if you want to work. Exactly. Do exposure correction and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. White balance. Pop up the the color. The, you know, change some of the. It, pump up the clarity, that kind of thing. That's what Lightroom will help you do. GIMP, a lot of people don't know about it, but it is a free version of Photoshop that's not created by Adobe. It's created by individual developers. So keep in mind that every time they come out with a new version, there might be a bug or two in there, and they're constantly doing bug correction. But it is a good free option. It comes with a real nasty learning curve, though. It's most people I know that have used Photoshop and then gone and tried to use GIMP have said that GIMP is a little bit harder to use. So if you buy GIMP, try and find a good website or a manual out there that you can use. Sticks are okay. This shot took me about 100 times to make it. Not on that particular car, but I sat, up, sat outside the Herberger on a photography class, waiting for people to fly by and I screwed it up a million times. It's what's called panning shots. So as this car is moving, I'm moving too. Sometimes I had my shutter speed too slow. Sometimes somebody was walking in front of my camera. So I screwed this shot up a million times, but I got what I thought was a decent one. But still, I got the pole in front of it. So Learning photography equals lots and lots of mistakes, but learning how that mistake happens means that you improve. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to script choice. But it's not okay to continue doing the mistake because you didn't learn from how it happened in the first place. So if somebody criticizes a photo, especially somebody that knows a thing or two about photography, don't get pissed off at them. They're trying to help you. So that's the lesson I've had to learn because I'm so emotionally attached to the stuff I do. When somebody says, this is good but could be better, I get all flustered. And, oh my god, somebody doesn't love what I do. Don't give up. Photography takes time. And that's okay to make your mistakes. Giving up is a giant one. Don't do it. Join photography meetup groups. They're free, most of them. Um, and they take you to some cool places. One of the places that I went to this past year was the Hall of Flame. Anybody been there? It's a museum for firefighters. It's one of the, one of the rare ones in the world. And Phoenix has one of the largest ones. Um, it's right over by the, um, yeah, near the Phoenix Zoo and where the, uh, the, the A's play. Thank you. That's what I was trying to think of. Um, it, it's awesome inside. And it's, it's a great place to shoot. And it's cheap. And kids love it. So if you want something for your kids to do indoors, there you go. And lastly, Carpe Diem sees the day. Great cameras don't equal great photography any more than great skillets make great chefs. I've had terrible meals from people with great, great equipment, and I have seen great shots from so-so cameras. Better cameras do help. You have to learn how to use them, but they do make some of the shots out there possible. Um, your standard point and shoot may not be able to shoot a shot uh, of a F1 car coming by. The physical limitation of the camera. Not anything you're doing. That's where a better camera can sometimes come in and help make it possible. Be proud of your work. Share it. Frame it. Put it on your wall. People say, that is an awesome shot. Where, where did you get that? Where did you buy that? I took it. Oh, really? How did you do that? and have that conversation. Be happy with, with what you're doing.
Get some of your initial work, put it up on the wall, and you think better work, hold it down, put something else up. Love what you do, do what you love. If you don't like taking photos of babies, don't take photos of babies. It makes, it makes money, it's a, it, it's a good revenue source, but I don't find those shots inspiring, so I don't take them. Um, people who don't like going to weddings shouldn't take wedding photos. They should let other people take wedding photos. If you love nature, go do it, because it'll show in your work. If, if what you're seeing in front of you wows you, and you can capture that wow, that's loving what you do and doing what you love. That's it. Uh, any questions? Which one? The one on this slide. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that was at a photography class at the Boyce Thompson Arboretum. Can you there? Yeah. Yeah, I love that place. And it was a, it was a portrait photography class, and they asked some people that were there, you know, just volunteers, uh, you know, anybody open to get a shot. And it's not a perfect shot because there's light coming across the guy's face, but I do love the expression on his face, you know, with the dog looking at him. And